Currently, China is facing several pressing issues. The increasing number of university graduates is leading to a rising trend of youth unemployment. Additionally, the unstable economic growth in China is causing significant pressure on the younger generation. Furthermore, new regulations in the delivery industry are eliciting strong reactions from workers, resulting in a surge of resignations. Lastly, the immigration of Chinese millionaires overseas is creating a sense of instability and concern within society. The issue of high youth unemployment in China is becoming increasingly severe, especially with the projected increase in university graduates this year to 11.79 million, a rise of 210,000 from last year. Let's watch a video about the challenges and frustrations faced by recent graduates in China's job market. In response to this challenge, mainland universities are taking proactive measures to guide graduates towards diverse career paths beyond civil service exams and postgraduate studies, emphasizing the importance of contributing to poverty alleviation efforts in rural areas. Notably, institutions like Heilongjiang University, Jilin University, the School of Economics at Fujian University, and Hainan Normal University have all issued proposals or open letters advocating for graduates to explore opportunities in grassroots service projects. These initiatives aim to encourage graduates to adapt their employment expectations and actively engage in initiatives that contribute to societal welfare. The urban youth unemployment rate soared to 21.3 percent as of June 2023, according to official statistics from the Chinese Communist Party, indicating the severity of the employment crisis. Some economists suggest that the actual rate may be even higher, reflecting the immense challenges faced by young job seekers in urban areas. Furthermore, the difficult job market has led to a concerning trend of individuals resorting to purchasing job positions. During the Chinese New Year in 2024, there were reports of young people expressing a desire to work abroad to earn higher incomes. This trend is fueled by companies posing as consulting service providers, openly listing prices for various positions, including roles at prominent companies such as Master Kong and China Post. A recent post circulating on mainland China's social media platforms introduced a new era of 10 things for unemployed youth, outlining 10 things not to do, which highlights the frustration and helplessness under life pressures and a passive response to it. Commentators suggest that the articulated reasons why young people in China no longer want to strive reflect the current societal conditions. With China's economy experiencing a downturn, young people are facing immense life pressures, leading many to choose a passive lifestyle. A new version of the 10 unemployed youths has emerged, advocating for abstaining from donating blood, charity, marriage, having children, buying houses, purchasing lottery tickets, investing in the stock market or funds, assisting the elderly, and being moved emotionally. Traveling commentator Tang Jingyuan points out that behind each of these abstentions lies a significant social crisis. For instance, the reluctance to donate blood stems from the prevalence of unexplained disappearances among China's youth, especially as organ harvesting becomes industrialized. Tang also highlights the erosion of trust in the government due to its malevolent actions, which discourage people from engaging in public service activities. The 10 unemployed youths represent a more advanced version of the lying flat phenomenon, indicating a proactive rejection of societal norms. This movement differs from previous passive behaviors, as it signifies a more assertive form of resistance against the authorities, indicating a broader disillusionment with the existing system. The recent findings from the American Association for the Advancement of Science shed light on a concerning trend. Within the past three months, over 10 Chinese doctoral students, all holding valid U.S. visas, faced rejection upon attempting to re-enter the United States after visiting their home country, resulting in immediate deportation. Furthermore, some of these individuals were subjected to a five-year ban on re-entry. While the exact reasons behind these refusals remain shrouded in ambiguity, their respective universities are stepping in to facilitate their return and continuation of studies. Zhang Junjia, a Chinese student enrolled in a U.S. academic institution, has drawn attention to the mounting precautions being taken by American universities and governmental bodies in response to the escalating tensions between China and the U.S. These measures are rooted in concerns regarding potential infiltration by Chinese nationals. Analysts have speculated about the possible factors contributing to the refusals faced by these students, given that there are nearly 290,000 Chinese students currently studying in the U.S. Human rights advocate Wu Xiaoping, based in the U.S., has put forward several hypotheses to explain these incidents.
These include the students' involvement in activities unrelated to their academic pursuits, their association with sensitive high-tech fields, or discrepancies in their visa applications, such as failure to disclose membership in the Chinese Communist Party. Additionally, there have been reports of students enduring extensive interrogations and involuntary repatriations. Wu Xiaoping has defended the U.S.'s prerogative to conduct thorough investigations in the interest of national security. He contends that some students may harbor sympathies for the CCP, which could compromise U.S. interests. It's worth noting that former President Trump's directive, aimed at barring Chinese students and researchers with military affiliations, resulted in the revocation or denial of visas for thousands. The situation has escalated further, with recent months witnessing a significant increase in the frequency of forced repatriations, as revealed by Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin on January 4, 2024. Given the increasing unemployment among the youth and the Chinese people facing ostracism from Western countries, the government has taken firm steps to shatter any hope of job opportunities for its citizens. One of these measures is the introduction of the new delivery law. The announcement from the Chinese government stated that the newly revised express delivery industry management measures have been officially implemented on March 1. This indicates stricter regulations for the delivery industry. Due to these new regulations, more and more delivery personnel are resigning, directly paralyzing China's logistics. On the third day after the new express delivery regulations were implemented, for delivery personnel from a station resigned after being complained about. Many people may not be clear about the extent of the impact caused by delivery personnel resigning directly. Let me explain briefly. Each express delivery station usually has several routes, dividing the entire area. One person is responsible for one area, following the three express, one reach rule. Currently, the delivery fee is $0.07 per order, and a delivery person usually has to deliver over 300 parcels a day. In addition, some express deliveries need to be placed in express stations. Usually, for this delivery method, the express delivery station will pay the delivery person an extra $0.042 per order. Typically, each express delivery station will have one delivery person responsible for all the express stations in the area, delivering around 700 to 800 parcels a day. So, their salary is relatively high, around $845.01 per month. However, handling 700 to 800 parcels requires them to work continuously for 14 to 15 hours. The turnover rate of employees in the express delivery industry is particularly high. For example, if a delivery person quits, they have to inform the boss in advance. Then, the boss of the express delivery station has to start recruiting online. The new employees recruited need to be trained by an experienced delivery person for about a week to ensure there are no mistakes. However, some people can't bear the hardship. Typically, it takes about half a month for a new delivery person to replace an old one smoothly. But if suddenly four delivery personnel from a station resign, the situation changes. The worst-case scenario is that there will be no one to deliver the express parcels in the warehouse. In this case, fines will be imposed for incomplete deliveries, and if the signing rate does not meet standards, fines will also be imposed. In the worst-case scenario, the boss of the station may also quit, completely paralyzing this route. This is some insider information about the express delivery industry. I want to let everyone know a little bit. But from what I understand about the overall situation on the internet, many people are saying, why could express delivery be delivered to the door before, but not anymore? It's all because consumers have indulged them. Now that they don't indulge their faults, they just quit. There are so many people in China. If you don't do it, someone else will. However, in this issue, the contradiction between the delivery person and the customer is just superficial. The root cause of this contradiction is the conflict between the express delivery company and the delivery personnel. If all express delivery companies can raise the delivery fees for e-commerce merchants, then e-commerce merchants will raise the prices of goods. In the end, after the entire population pays the bill, express delivery companies like 3 Express, one reach will learn from SF Express and JD.com in delivering express parcels. Then, this problem can be solved. Many netizens say, I just want to use express cabinets or express stations because I want to save money. I don't want to pay for delivery upstairs, and I don't want e-commerce merchants to raise the prices of goods. But now, 
you have no choice because if a user who pays $1.39 for postage complains about the delivery person, resulting in a fine of $1,408, then this route is cut off. Your express delivery still won't arrive. Today is the third day after the implementation of the new express delivery regulations, and the number of express delivery complaints nationwide has increased significantly. So, from this trend, all illusions will be shattered. The ultimate goal is only one, the prices of goods will increase, the delivery fees for express delivery will rise, and the entire population will pay for it, increasing job opportunities. So, the days of the express delivery industry are about to change. With so many express delivery companies, whoever acts first will occupy more market share. If they are still reluctant to increase the delivery fees for delivery personnel and dare not increase the delivery fees for e-commerce merchants, they will definitely be eliminated or resign. After the new regulations, logistics have come to a standstill, delivery personnel are resigning, and express delivery prices have risen hastily. This is the situation at sorting points after the new regulations, piles of parcels waiting to be delivered with no one in sight. The grievances of delivery personnel lie in the fact that they earn only a few cents for each parcel, yet they have to make phone calls to every recipient to deliver the parcels to their homes. If a customer doesn't answer the phone, do they need to redial? With every company offering home delivery, how many flights of stairs do they need to climb to make deliveries? Previously, they could deliver hundreds of parcels, but now they can only deliver dozens, not to mention the money deducted for incomplete tasks due to complaints. Regarding the new regulations, merchants are indifferent. They believe that if delivery fees increase, they can simply raise the prices of their goods. Ultimately, it's the consumers who will bear the brunt. Consumers' opinions on the new regulations are polarized. The main actors in deliveries to sign out stations are young people and single women who are usually not at home and don't have time to wait for deliveries. Moreover, they are concerned that home delivery may provide opportunities for criminals to identify single women and determine when they are not at home, leading to potential risks. The Chinese government's recent declaration regarding the implementation of revised regulations for the express delivery industry on March 1 marks a significant shift in the management of this sector. The updated measures signal a tightening of controls over delivery operations, prompting a wave of resignations among delivery personnel. This mass exodus is having a direct and immediate impact on China's logistics infrastructure, causing disruptions and delays in the delivery network. Delivery workers are stepping down in response to the newly enforced regulations and mounting grievances, compelling customers to personally collect their parcels from distribution centers. Entire delivery hubs are even ceasing operations entirely, leading entire towns without package deliveries and plunging communities into disarray. Under the updated regulations, delivery firms face hefty fines of up to $4,615 for the unauthorized use of smart parcel lockers and distribution centers. The swift enforcement of these penalties sparked a silent revolt among delivery staff. Within two days of the regulation announcement, couriers began tendering their resignations, igniting a wave of discussion on Chinese social media platforms like Weibo. Many couriers voiced concerns over the strictness of the regulations, citing increased workloads and diminished earnings as major drawbacks, ultimately diminishing the allure of the courier profession. The repercussions of the regulations are already being felt in Anhui province, where the first $4,615 fine has been issued, striking fear into the hearts of some delivery workers who opted to quit rather than risk similar penalties. Those who left their positions early count themselves fortunate, realizing the severity of the fines in comparison to their modest incomes. Earning approximately $769.23 to $923.08 per month, with a significant portion allocated to mortgage payments, the prospect of a $4,615 fine seems insurmountable for many. In China, doorstep delivery has remained elusive for most courier services over the past decade, barring a few exceptions like JD.com and SF Express. This is largely attributed to the prevailing payment structure, where delivery personnel are compensated per delivery, with meager rates offered by standard companies. As a result, many couriers opt for expedited drop-off methods like smart lockers or delivery centers to maximize efficiency. While this approach streamlines operations for delivery workers, it often leaves customers dissatisfied, requiring them to invest additional time and sometimes incur extra charges to retrieve their packages. 
Amidst China's economic downturn and political instability, there's been a noticeable surge in the flight of capital. A recent incident spotlighted this trend when a Chinese woman was apprehended at Zhuhai attempting to depart with $250,000 in hand, prompting widespread discourse. Identified as Xia, she was intercepted at Gongbei Port of Entry on March 4 for exceeding the regulated limit while using the undisclosed exit. Subsequently, she faced penalties and had the excess cash confiscated by customs authorities. This occurrence ignited a flurry of discussions among mainland internet users who questioned the rationale behind restrictions on personal fund movements. Many interpreted it as a form of capital flight, dubbing it the ant moving house strategy, where funds are siphoned abroad incrementally to sidestep regulatory oversight. This incident is indicative of a broader trend with reports surfacing of similar cases suggesting a growing pattern among affluent Chinese individuals seeking to discreetly relocate substantial sums overseas to evade governmental scrutiny and mitigate economic uncertainties. Despite the tightening grip of government regulations and geopolitical tensions, individuals are employing diverse tactics to smuggle funds out of the country, leveraging third-party agents and exploiting lax customs protocols, particularly in regions like Hong Kong. Furthermore, Chinese travelers frequently leave behind cash while abroad, further contributing to the exodus of funds from the country. Economists speculate that billions of dollars might have been funneled overseas through this method in 2023 alone. The immigration of Chinese millionaires overseas has become a topic of considerable attention in recent years. According to the 2019 World Wealth Migration Report, China leads the world in the number of millionaire immigrants, with a large number of millionaires choosing to leave China each year, taking their wealth and skills to other countries. This phenomenon raises questions, why do these millionaires choose to emigrate overseas? What impact does their departure have on China? The motivation behind millionaire emigration overseas can be understood from three levels, individual, familial, and societal. At the individual level, millionaires emigrate overseas primarily to seek better wealth management and protection. In China, millionaires face many restrictions and constraints on wealth management. They often cannot freely manage their assets or obtain adequate security and protection. Therefore, they choose to transfer their wealth to other countries to achieve better wealth management and protection. For example, they may use immigration to evade foreign exchange controls, convert large amounts of RMB assets into foreign currency assets, or enjoy lower tax rates through immigration to reduce wealth loss. From a familial perspective, millionaire immigration overseas is mainly to provide better education and living environments for their children. In China, millionaires have many choices for their children's education. Many millionaires choose to send their children abroad for study, enabling them to receive higher quality education and experience more diverse cultures. For example, some millionaires join U.S. citizenship to enable their daughters to enter Harvard University. From a societal perspective, millionaire immigration overseas is primarily in response to China's economic and political uncertainties and changes. In China, the wealth and status of millionaires are often affected by economic and political factors. They may suffer losses or crises due to market fluctuations, policy adjustments, fierce competition, and other factors, or they may encounter troubles due to a lack of laws, a lack of supervision, and the pressure of public opinion. Therefore, they choose to immigrate to more stable and freer countries to avoid risks and troubles. In conclusion, the challenges facing China, from high youth unemployment to the expulsion of Chinese students in the U.S. and the implementation of new delivery regulations, underscore the complexities of the country's socioeconomic landscape. While universities are taking proactive steps to guide graduates and initiatives like the 10 Things for Unemployed Youth movement reflect societal frustrations, deeper issues persist. The trend of purchasing job positions and the immigration of millionaires highlight systemic challenges that require comprehensive solutions. As China navigates these challenges, addressing underlying economic and political uncertainties will be essential to fostering a more stable and prosperous future for its citizens. Hello everyone, my name is Chen Dongbo. I am a rural girl from Xinyang, Hunan. I abandoned my old job and, through the trust of clients and help from others, officially established my own company, Minshang, on August 15, 2017. With hard work and experience, I have gained recognition in the fashion industry. On November 28, 2018, my company's headquarters settled in Guangzhou.
After a year of hard work, the company established eight subsidiaries, developed 750 physical stores. As time passed, by the end of 2019, I had more than 500 employees. But nothing good lasts forever. As China's economy went downhill, so did my customers. All of my stores closed, inventory piled up, and the company's financial situation became tighter. At that time, I financed, borrowed, sold houses to withstand the pressure. But, eventually, in January 2022, I couldn't bear it anymore. My company was surrounded by creditors, followed by an endless bombardment of debt collection. In the end, I have over a hundred million in debt for the company. My husband and I gave our savings worth of a lifetime of hard work to the creditors. Money can be earned again, but once trust is lost, it is difficult to rebuild. The money my husband and I earned with hard work was lost due to my own lack of understanding of the market, and in the end, my family paid the price. My company officially closed its doors on January 10, 2022. In the intricate web of global commerce, a seismic shift has occurred, marking a pivotal moment in the history of international trade relations. For the first time since 2002, the United States has imported more goods from Mexico than from China, underscoring a realignment of trade partnerships and supply chain strategies that resonates across economies and borders. This historic shift is not merely a statistic but a reflection of evolving geopolitical tensions, supply chain disruptions, and a global revaluation of trade practices and partners. Without the import of the Western world, many companies, enterprises and factories are forced to close down and deserted. Juting Electronics in Shanghai Songjiang Import and Export Processing Zone is now overgrown with weeds, with the grass taller than the door sign. There are fewer and fewer people in Shanghai. Many factories have moved away or closed down. It is getting harder and harder to work. Also, according to Bloomberg estimates, if Trump takes office and implements his campaign promise to increase tariffs on China by 60%, China's exports to the United States will basically return to zero by 2030, which further worsening the economy of China. This production facility is empty without a soul. Hard to imagine this was once a prosperous company. Workshops and factories are closing. Workers hope for a better future for them and their family. Shui Sharon, associate professor at Fudan University, shared his view about the topic. On January 10, 2024, the paper published a set of statistics from the U.S. Department of Commerce, mainly covering U.S.-China import and export trade data from January to November 2013. The data shows that U.S. imports from China continued to decline over the previous 11 months. For example, while the U.S. previously imported large quantities of mobile phones from China, it now imports more from India. Some home appliances previously imported from China are now sourced from Vietnam. Based on the changes in U.S.-China economic and trade relations reflected in the U.S. Commerce Department statistics, the paper concluded that in 2023, China may fall from its position as America's largest source of imports for the first time ever. After over 40 years of reform and opening up, U.S.-China relations have undergone a qualitative shift, China's ranking among America's import sources may continue to decline. Meanwhile, China's proportion of total U.S. imports will also keep falling. In fact, the downward trend in U.S. imports from China has been observable very early.
economic and geopolitical forces at play. The backdrop to this shift is a complex tapestry of economic policies and geopolitical events. The scrutiny of the Chinese Communist Party CCP's economic activities, alongside President Xi Jinping's austere strict COVID policies, has significantly impacted the Chinese economy. Actions perceived as aggressive by the CCP, particularly in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea, have further intensified regional tensions and contributed to a deteriorating relationship between China and the United States in military, diplomatic, and economic spheres. Under the Trump administration, the U.S. began imposing tariffs on Chinese imports in 2018, citing violations of global trade rules. This stance found continuity with President Biden's administration, emphasizing confrontation with the CCP as a rare bipartisan consensus. The introduction of the friendshoring policy by the Biden administration marked a strategic pivot aimed at consolidating supply chains within the U.S. and allied countries, essentially dialing back decades of manufacturing production outsourced to China. Also, making U.S. companies and its allies withdraw from China is also part of the trade war. Samsung Heavy Industries appears to be unwavering in its determination to accelerate its withdrawal from China, despite the risks of overflowing orders and labor shortages. Following the closure of Samsung Heavy Industries in Ningbo, the facility in Rongqing, Weihai, which seems to be the last remaining foothold for Samsung Heavy Industries in China, appears destined for closure and liquidation. Reports indicate that Samsung Heavy Industries has been operating at a loss in China due to export hardship, forcing the company to continually shrink its operations in the country. It's worth noting that Samsung Heavy Industries' decision to withdraw from China was not without prior indications. As early as 2018, the company began gradually reducing its operations in China, redirecting its focus towards markets like South Korea and Vietnam. By 2020, Samsung Heavy Industries officially announced a complete exit from the Chinese market. Analysts suggest that, in addition to operational and management issues, the strained trade and political relations between China and South Korea may have influenced Samsung Heavy Industries' decision. However, specific reasons await an official statement from the company. Teradyne, a well-known American semiconductor manufacturer, recently announced that it will withdraw its manufacturing business worth approximately $1 billion U.S. dollars from China. Teradyne's move is due to the impact of the U.S. government's technology export controls to China. Teradyne's Suzhou factory in China is its main production base for semiconductor testing equipment. However, due to restrictions on some parts originating from the United States, Teradyne's Suzhou factory in China is its main production base for semiconductor testing equipment. The company had to consider moving its assembly plants to Malaysia. Mexico's rising precedence in U.S. imports. The global pandemic further exacerbated supply chain vulnerabilities, prompting companies to reassess their reliance on distant suppliers. Mexico has emerged as a primary beneficiary of this strategic shift, with its proximity to the U.S. and lower manufacturing costs making it an attractive alternative. The influence of geopolitical risks, accentuated by the Russia-Ukraine conflict and China's perceived alignment with Russia, has driven companies to diversify their supply chains away from China. Significant investments by multinational corporations in Mexico further illustrate this trend. The trade figures reveal a telling story. In 2023, U.S. imports from Mexico surged to $475 billion, up nearly 5% from the previous year, while imports from China plummeted by 20% to $427 billion. This pivot is not solely a matter of economics but reflects a broader reassessment of geopolitical alignments and the desirability of stabilizing and shortening supply chains. This shift in trade dynamics is a barometer of changing economic winds, signaling a move towards more resilient and politically aligned trade practices. The implications for global trade networks are profound, highlighting the influence of geopolitical tensions on economic decisions and the agility with which countries and companies must navigate this new landscape. The transition of the U.S.-China trade relationship into one where Mexico now stands as a leading trade partner to the U.S. represents not just a change in sourcing preferences but a deeper realignment of global economic structures. Amidst these changes, countries and companies are compelled to adapt to the realities of a world where political, economic, and health crises intermingle, shaping the future of global trade in profound and lasting ways. 
China's economic landscape shattered by the brutal waves of the U.S.-China trade war. The economic landscape of China has faced significant turbulence due to the escalating trade war with the United States. This confrontation between the world's two largest economies has not only reshaped global trade dynamics but also imposed profound economic repercussions on China, demonstrating the vulnerability of its export-led growth model to international policy shifts. The U.S. government's decision to increase tariff rates drastically on a substantial volume of commodities imported from China marked a departure from decades of trade liberalization, bringing to light the fragility of China's economic prosperity tied to its access to global markets. Qinglin Sanitary Ware, due to hardship, has moved out of Shenzhen, leading behind an empty factory. The largest factory in Shaojing, Shenzhen, was relocated. Most of the workers left and nearby shops closed down. The imposition of tariffs by the U.S., peaking at 25 percentage points on 50 billion worth of commodities and 10 percentage points on 200 billion more, aimed to penalize China for long-standing grievances over intellectual property theft and forced technology transfer practices. However, beneath the surface of these political maneuvers lies the heavy toll these policies have inflicted on China's economic engines, its exporting firms, Stanford University's China briefs. Research leveraging exhaustive proprietary data from approximately 20,000 firms in a prefecture-level city in eastern China, reflective of the broader national trend, reveals that the tariff hikes have significantly dented the profitability of Chinese exporters. Despite their efforts to maintain export prices, the tariffs have led to a notable decrease in sales volumes to the U.S., constricting firms' revenue streams and profits. It is not a rare sight to see this scene. The current situation of an industrial zone in Foshan, Guangdong, its glory has become a thing of the past. This economic strife has reverberated beyond corporate bottom lines, affecting the broader Chinese economy. According to the National Bureau of Economic Research, by late 2019, China faced retaliatory tariffs on $100 billion of its exports NBER. This tit-for-tat tariff escalation constrains the flow of goods, distorting market operations and the efficient allocation of resources. Furthermore, the World Trade Organization outlines that the trade conflict has precipitated a sizable reduction in trade between the U.S. and China, leading to significant trade diversion and the subsequent reconfiguration of East Asian value chains, WTO. These disruptions underscore the trade war's role in unsettling the economic foundation of not only China but also the intricate web of global trade relations. The trade war's impact is not limited to macroeconomic indicators but extends to the livelihoods of the Chinese populace. Innovative research by Davin Shore at Tuck Schools, utilizing satellite imagery to assess economic activity, indicates a palpable decline in manufacturing employment and per capita income in regions most exposed to U.S. tariffs. This decline is emblematic of the human cost of the trade war, translating into lost jobs, diminished incomes, and an exacerbation of economic inequality within China. The U.S.-China trade war has inflicted deep economic wounds on China, challenging the tenacity of its export-oriented growth model and exposing the intricacies of its integration with the global economy. The repercussions of these policy decisions manifest not only in statistical declines in trade volumes and GDP growth rates but also in the diminished economic welfare of millions of Chinese citizens. As the trade war narrative unfolds, it becomes increasingly apparent that the true cost of these tariffs transcends mercurial political victories, embedding itself in the very fabric of China's economic and social landscape. Tremendous Noise Explosion in Shanghai and the Truth Behind the Silence of CCP At 7.24 p.m. on January 29, a deafening roar shattered the serenity of Shanghai's Songjiang district, piercing the night sky with a blinding flash. From the tranquil confines of their homes, startled residents were abruptly jolted into a state of panic as they witnessed the windows quivering, homes swaying, and parked vehicles jolting violently on the streets below. It was a moment of sheer chaos, a surreal symphony of disarray that seemed to defy the very fabric of reality. As the echoes of the cataclysmic event reverberated across the district, the digital realm ignited with a fervor of speculation, swiftly seizing the attention of audiences nationwide. Like wildfire, whispers spread across social media, casting a damning shadow of suspicion over land space, an entity now synonymous with a large-scale experiment gone disastrously awry. 
In the murky depths of the online domain, reports began to surface, revealing the grim toll exacted upon three individuals whose identities remained shrouded in mystery, their fates precariously hanging in the balance. However, amidst the clamor and chaos, the Songjiang District Emergency Management Bureau boldly stood in defiance, adamantly refuting any notion of an explosion. With a dismissive attitude, they offered naught but a vague promise of forthcoming clarification, a feeble attempt to assuage the mounting tide of uncertainty. Yet, as the dust settled and the clamor subsided, their hollow assurances crumbled beneath the weight of unrelenting scrutiny, leaving naught but a void of unanswered questions and lingering doubts in their wake. The silence emanating from official channels only served to deepen the intrigue, fueling the insatiable hunger for elusive truths amidst a tempest of rampant speculation. While some economic tabloids and semi-official outlets like Chai Sin pointed accusatory fingers at land space, the military-industrial juggernaut vehemently denied any complicity, attributing the chaotic commotion to a routine test gone tragically awry. Yet, their carefully crafted narrative wilted beneath the searing scrutiny of eyewitness accounts, the thunderous roar of the explosion transcending the confines of their feeble attempts at explanation. Amidst the swirling maelstrom of uncertainty, the pervasive veil of secrecy draped ominously over the entire ordeal, casting dark shadows of suspicion upon the very fabric of truth. Many whispered of sinister military involvement, spinning tales of a failed Chinese military missile launch as the catalyst behind the cataclysmic explosion. In the dimly lit corners of the online domain, discussions were steeped in an air of clandestine intrigue, with Shanghai netizens cautiously guarding whispered secrets like prized relics of forbidden knowledge. The sudden blackout of the internet, the erection of cordons, and the eerie silence of emergency sirens only served to fan the flames of suspicion, igniting fears of a meticulously orchestrated cover-up. And yet, amidst the chaos and confusion, whispers of an even darker truth began to emerge, tales of fireworks scattered amidst the debris and the tragic loss of Chinese military researchers. The sudden and irrevocable departure of these skilled minds, painstakingly nurtured with untold investments of time and resources, undoubtedly sent shockwaves rippling through the very fabric of the military research community. Yet, rather than confront the grim reality head-on, the authorities in Shanghai opted to bury the incident deep within the recesses of oblivion, concealing the truth beneath layers of deceit and deception, forever shrouded in the veil of secrecy. Government owes nine months' wages, employees suffer under CCP rule. Local governments in China are grappling with a financial crisis, forcing cuts to civil servants' pay. Many agencies are unable to pay salaries, and analysts foresee ongoing salary and bonus reductions becoming commonplace through 2024. Video footage circulating online depicts employees of the Transportation Bureau in Zuzhou District, Tianjin, staging a protest over nine months of unpaid wages, with a considerable police presence and numerous police vehicles stationed nearby. Social media reports indicate that local governments are facing financial difficulties, with civil servant salaries in Juching City, Shandong Province, being delayed for three months in order to cover payments before the Chinese New Year. To address funding shortages, the government has instructed civil servants to secure loans for government use, with department heads required to borrow 600,000 yuan, deputy heads 300,000 yuan, and ordinary staff 200,000 yuan, and salary payments contingent upon meeting these loan targets. Leading up to the Lunar New Year, Dong Nan Jun Chi, a real estate developer in Xi'an Shanxi, had not yet paid wages to workers, leading to emotional scenes where a man seeking his salary was seen in tears and willing to kneel for it. On February 6, a group of migrant workers, denied their wages, gathered outside the Jinhai District Government Building in Tianjin, urgently seeking resolution to their issue, only to be met with attempts by security personnel to prevent them from approaching the building. Videos emerged showing construction workers protesting on a highway near the Chichu Mountain Toll Station in Zutong County, Minyang City, Sichuan, on New Year's Eve due to unpaid wages. In Waxi, reports surfaced of dozens of migrant workers seeking overdue wages from China Construction 8th Engineering Division being detained at a police station without food for an entire day. These incidents serve as indicators of severe financial strain at the local level in China. Hospitals are also facing salary delays, 
with Lu Shannon Hospital in Yangdu County, Shandong, owing employees eight months of wages. In response, the hospital director initiated a hunger strike to express remorse over the unpaid wages. Financial difficulties in Shangchu Hunan led to a hospital in Shuiyang District being mortgaged to a bank. Diversion of medical insurance funds for daily PCR testing during the pandemic depleted hospital resources, leading to salary disputes. The situation is compounded by the bank directly collecting payments at hospitals, making it harder to pay doctors. Additionally, some individuals cannot afford medical insurance due to increased costs, exacerbating hospital financial strains. In 2023, China's local government funds and income from land sales dropped by over 20 percent. This signals a big problem, local governments are spending more money than they're making. A financial article from last November says that for the past few years, most local governments didn't have enough money, with only a few seeing growth. Even those with some growth are just barely keeping things balanced financially. This is mainly because they rely too much on selling land and spend too much on building things like roads and bridges when the economy is slow. 44,000 shops fallen. Low price coffee battle in China sparks wave of closures. More than 44,000 coffee shops have closed down. China's low price coffee battle triggers a wave of closures. This year, a surge of entrepreneurs entered the coffee market, leading to an increase in coffee shops and the beginning of a brutal shakeout. China's sluggish economy and consumer downgrade have affected the coffee industry. Major chain brands started a 9.9 yuan low-price coffee battle this year, gaining significant market share. However, independent coffee shops that focus on medium to high price ranges couldn't afford to follow suit, resulting in a wave of closures. As of October 29, 2023, 44,000 coffee shops have closed across mainland China. The casualties of this consumer downgrade-induced coffee war are mainly independent coffee shops that target a price range of 20 to 30 yuan. According to 21st Century Business Herald, this year, leading chain coffee brands such as Liu King Coffee and Coffee Box kicked off a wave of 9.9 yuan coffee battles. Although these big brands saw a decline in profits, their revenue surged, and they rapidly expanded their stores. Liu Qin Coffee's second quarter revenue and store count have surpassed Starbucks, making it the leading chain coffee brand in mainland China. According to Zhujiang TV, chain coffee brands offering coffee at 9.9 yuan and 8.8 yuan have taken over the market. In Hangzhou's Madukyo Road, there are both Liu Qin and numerous independent coffee shops. Some independent coffee shop owners complained, the 9.9 yuan pricing is a bit outrageous, we can't lower our prices just because they're cheaper, we don't have the money, selling cheaper will only lead us to continuous losses. An independent coffee shop owner limited to Interface News, it's tough for me with Liu Qin and Coffee Box opening next to my shop. The owner mentioned that in May of this year, after Liu Qin and Coffee Box opened within 200 meters of their store, Luckin's opening directly caused their revenue to drop by 40%, and Coffee Box's opening cut it in half. In response, they launched an 8.8 yuan discount coupon, but they immediately began losing money. Many entrepreneurs with similar experiences cried out, my independent coffee shop is being killed by the 9.9 yuan coffee. A Xiaohangshu blogger named Bai Yuan Li Mei stated that she opened an independent coffee shop in Tianjin in May 2022, thinking that financial professionals have a habit of drinking coffee, so she chose a location near several big banks. However, she soon found that having the habit of drinking coffee doesn't mean having the habit of paying for it. Many people were already accustomed to buying 9.9 yuan coffee from Liu Qin. While the density of coffee shops is increasing, the lifespan of new openings is getting shorter. Many new coffee shops, especially individual ones, often close within just two to three months of operation. Despite expectations, coffee shop operations are not smooth. The store has been losing money, and after three months, it announced closure and transfer. According to Dongda, the high density of coffee shops is a significant reason for their losses. Alibaba laid off 20,000 employees last year, former execs now deliver gigs. Alibaba laid off 20,000 employees last year, 
former execs now deliver gigs. Alibaba, the Chinese e-commerce behemoth, ruthlessly slashed its workforce by a staggering 20,000 employees in 2023, a move that adds to the mounting turmoil within the company. This morning, as Alibaba announced its fiscal third quarter earnings, it also declared a whopping $25 billion increase in its stock buyback program. The workforce at Alibaba shrunk to 219,260 individuals by the end of 2023, a significant drop from the nearly 240,000 employees it had at the close of 2022. Shockingly, Bloomberg reports that Alibaba axed a similar number of employees throughout 2022, as well. The brutal layoffs at Alibaba coincide with its efforts to offload several non-core businesses. Despite the turmoil, Alibaba managed to report earnings per share, excluding certain items, at $2.67 for the period, slightly surpassing analysts' expectations. Revenue also saw a modest 5% year-over-year increase, reaching $36.67 billion, exceeding analysts' estimates by $270 million. Amid China's economic slowdown, Alibaba's e-commerce sector is losing ground to competitors, particularly those offering cheaper alternatives like Pinduoduo by PDD Holdings. Additionally, Alibaba's cloud computing division saw only a marginal 3% year-over-year revenue increase, while EBITDA surged by 86% as Alibaba prioritized profitability. CEO Eddie Wu emphasized that Alibaba's main focus is reigniting growth in its core businesses, namely e-commerce and cloud computing. Wu pledged to inject more funds into enhancing customer experiences within the e-commerce sector. Despite these efforts, Alibaba's stock plummeted by 5% today and has remained relatively stagnant over the past month. Moreover, shares have plummeted nearly 30% over the past year, reflecting the mounting challenges and uncertainties surrounding the company's future. Shocking revelation inside the Chinese economy, GDP growth is only 0 to 1%. China's landscape is marred by the sight of homeless individuals strewn across its streets at night, long queues of jobless workers vying for scarce employment opportunities, and thousands rallying in protests demanding payment for overdue wages. Even the affluent and investors have joined the fray in recent months, protesting against encroachments on their rights. The Chinese stock market, in a staggering downturn, witnessed a historic plunge at year's end, signaling an alarming trajectory toward the imminent collapse of the CCP regime. Despite attempts by CCP leaders and state media to project confidence in China's economic prowess, economist Xu Qinggang has cast a shadow of doubt over these assertions. Su Qinggang, a distinguished figure in economics currently affiliated with esteemed institutions such as the Center for Chinese Economics and Institutions at Stanford University and Imperial College London, forewarns of a grim reality, China's economic growth, as measured by GDP, is poised to hover between 0 and 1 percent, with a looming financial crisis on the horizon. Speaking candidly during an interview, Su questioned the reliability of the Chinese Communist Party's official announcement of a 5.2% GDP growth for 2023. Citing alarming statistics, Su pointed to a stark rise in unemployment rates, particularly among the youth, with official reports indicating levels exceeding 20% and some economists' surveys suggesting rates surpassing 40%. Such stark unemployment figures are incongruent with the projected 5% economic growth. Moreover, Su highlighted declines in China's foreign trade and a slump in the real estate sector, a key pillar of the nation's GDP, casting further doubts on the credibility of the reported growth figures. Despite officials touting electric vehicles, batteries, and green energy as the new drivers of growth, Su argues that the combined value of these sectors pales in comparison to that of the real estate industry, representing only about 3% of total foreign trade. As such, he deems the official 5.2% economic growth figure unreliable. Drawing from various data sources, Su predicts that China's economic growth for 2023 is likely to hover close to zero, with the most plausible scenario slightly exceeding 0% but falling short of 1%. He attributes the economic challenges not to any single individual, but to systemic flaws within the CCP, warning of an impending large-scale crisis in the Chinese economy. 10,900 Chinese chip companies vanished, up nearly 90% from last year. 
As of December 11, 2023, China has seen a staggering 10,900 chip companies shut down or have their registrations revoked by the industrial and commercial authorities. That's an average of over 31 chip enterprises closing down or having their registrations revoked every single day. In the past five years alone, more than 22,000 chip-related businesses have faced closure or revocation. According to data from Oriental Wealth Choice, as of November 1st, 151 semiconductor-listed companies have disclosed their third-quarter reports for 2023, with a total operating income of approximately 352.3 billion yuan, almost flat compared to the same period last year. However, their combined net profit attributable to shareholders has plummeted by about 54% to around 19.3 billion yuan. Shockingly, out of these 151 listed semiconductor companies, a staggering 111 have seen their net profits plummet year-on-year, year, accounting for approximately 74% of the total. For instance, in October, AI chip design company Cambricon released its third-quarter financial report, revealing a staggering 66.15% year-on-year drop in operating income to 31.34 million yuan, with a net loss attributable to shareholders of a whopping 263 million yuan. From January to September 2023, Cambricon's revenue plummeted by 44.84% year-on-year to 146 million yuan, with a net loss of 808 million yuan. Furthermore, data shared by Professor Wei Xiaojun, director of the China Semiconductor Industry Association's Integrated Circuit Design Branch at ICAD 2023, indicates that there are a total of 3,243 chip design enterprises in China, with a shocking 55% of them generating less than 10 million yuan in sales revenue. Among China's semiconductor-listed companies, 30% are in the red, with an overall net profit decline of about 54% and a staggering 74% of them witnessing a decline in net profit. Experts predict that the majority of Chinese chip design companies will face massive losses in 2023 due to severe inventory backlog, saturated industry supply, and the inevitable devaluation of stock due to the flawed economic development policies of the Chinese Communist Party. Hitting a staggering 4.5 billion renminbi loss, Chinese supermarket chains collapsed. In a shocking turn of events, renowned supermarket chains Ren Renal, Bubugeo, and Yongwei Superstores have all reported staggering losses, sending shockwaves through the market. On January 30, 2024, the well established Shenzhen supermarket chain Ren Renal issued a notice stating that 2023 net loss of 470 to 520 million yuan compared to 507 million yuan in the previous year. Rim Rental cited various external and internal factors for declining revenue and underperformance. Originating from Shenzhen, Guangdong, Rim Rental once rivaled major foreign giants like Carrefour and Walmart. Despite going public in 2010 with over 10 billion yuan in annual revenue and 100 plus stores nationwide, Rim Rental faced financial struggles since its first loss in 2012. This marks Rim Rental's third consecutive warning of delisting due to losses compounded by a rising asset liability ratio of 108.7% by the end of the third quarter of 2023. Following suit, Hunan's leading retail enterprise, Bubugeo, released an announcement estimating a loss of 1.32 to 1.96 billion yuan attributable to shareholders of the listed company in 2023. At the same time, the company still faced the risk of bankruptcy due to the failure of restructuring as declared by the court. Specifically, Bubugeo anticipates a net loss between 1.32 billion and 1.96 billion yuan, marking a decrease of 22.94% to 48.11% compared to the previous year. The company attributed these losses to intensified industry competition and a liquidity crisis, resulting in operational challenges. Bubugeo responded by adjusting its strategy, optimizing store operations, and closing in profitable outlets, incurring significant expenses. Additionally, the liquidity crisis impacted Nanching Department Store's performance, prompting concerns about goodwill impairment. The company expects a decline in the overall fair value of investment properties, subject to evaluation and audit by appointed agencies. Yongwei Superstores, another heavyweight in the supermarket industry, was not spared from the financial turmoil. Revealing a net loss of 1.34 billion yuan for 2023, the company experienced a consecutive decline in profitability, 
with losses totaling 4.495 billion yuan in 2021 and 3 billion yuan in 2022. Faced with relentless competitive pressures and a deteriorating economic landscape, Yongli Superstores struggled to adapt, resorting to impairment tests on long-term assets as domestic stock prices plummeted. The unfolding crisis has cast a shadow over the future of these once-thriving supermarket giants. As uncertainties loom large, investors and industry analysts alike are left questioning the effectiveness of their strategies and the viability of their operations in the tumultuous retail landscape. Two hundred million job losses stem from China's small business bankruptcy wave. China is teetering on the edge of an economic abyss, as not only the titans of real estate and finance face financial ruin, but also a tsunami of small and micro enterprises stares down the barrel of closure, putting a staggering one hundred and eighty million jobs on the line. Shocking figures reveal that in the first half of twenty twenty three alone, four hundred and sixty thousand companies shuttered their doors. 3.1 million solo ventures vanished into thin air, and a staggering 3.73 million eateries closed up shop, leaving a trail of economic devastation in their wake. With 200 million people out of work, the nation is on the brink of an unprecedented crisis. A recent report from the China Institute for Inclusive Finance paints a grim picture of the financial health of small and micro enterprises. More than a third of surveyed businesses confessed to dire financial straits with regions like Hunan and Shanxi particularly hard hit. Meanwhile, a gaping disparity in financial stability plagues enterprises in Guangxi and Chongqing. With a staggering 80% of small businesses drowning in overdue payments, the pressure on cash flow is reaching a breaking point. As debts pile up, the specter of bankruptcy looms large, threatening to send shockwaves through the economy and plunge 180 million people into joblessness. On a global scale, small and micro-enterprises are the lifeblood of economies, contributing a lion's share of employment and GDP. In China, they provide a whopping 70% of all jobs. Yet, these enterprises lack the resilience of their larger counterparts, grappling with financing woes and a lack of technological edge. Should over 80% of them continue to face payment delays, the fallout could be catastrophic, with nearly 200 million livelihoods hanging in the balance. It's a grim reality, with a quarter of small businesses already on the brink of collapse. As China's stock and real estate markets spiral downward, investor confidence plummets to new lows. Even in major cities like Guangzhou and Shanghai, where purchase restrictions were lifted, December's sales plummeted by a staggering 17.1% year-on-year. This freefall underscores a widespread loss of faith in China's economic prospects, both at home and abroad. With banks tightening their grip on loans to small businesses and no relief in sight, the impending wave of closures and bankruptcies seems inevitable. Adding fuel to the fire, the closure of small and micro enterprises threatens to send shockwaves through the economy, disrupting supply chains and driving up prices. The ripple effect will reverberate far and wide, inflicting further misery on already beleaguered citizens and exacerbating economic woes. Chinese illusion of national trend free house giveaways, a deceptive reality. In recent times, there has been a surge in the real estate market with a trend of giving away houses for free. Several homeowners have come forward offering to transfer their properties for the remaining amount of their mortgage loans. Take Fang Qing from Zihui City, Xiaoqing, for instance. Her property, currently valued at 470,000 yuan, is roughly equivalent to her outstanding mortgage balance. While this may appear to offer buyers a chance to acquire the property at a discounted rate, the actual implications of such transactions may not be as advantageous as they seem. Who's willing to pay off my mortgage? I'll give the house away for free to whoever does, and you didn't hear it wrong. In the past few days, there's been a screenshot from an owner's group, and the chat messages in it say just that. This, you see, is a real thing, not just spreading negativity unintentionally. I remember back then many new property projects required reservations and were locked in specific units. This owner even said in the group that whoever wants it can have it, with unconditional cooperation for notarization and transfer, and they'll even cover the first month's mortgage payment for you. It's not hard to see that this owner bought the house in Huizhou during the peak of the real estate market. Now, the house should be worth around 600,000 yuan, but with mortgage rates dropping, they're out almost 400,000 yuan. 
For ordinary folks, that's catastrophic. They're even willing to cover the first month's payment for the new owner. Is this desperation due to a bad market or just a temporary slump? Behind the trend of free house giveaways, there are hidden risks. Firstly, owners may be facing financial difficulties and debt problems, potentially leading to property seizure or foreclosure before transfer. Secondly, if property prices continue to fall, buyers may face even greater economic losses. Furthermore, this type of transaction may involve high loan amounts and interest rates, which may not truly benefit buyers. On the surface, buyers may think they are getting a property at a relatively low price, but this could come with high loan interest, potential legal disputes, and even risks of the property's value decreasing. Especially for investors who were previously speculating in the property market, the current environment is significantly different. The uncertainty of property prices, changes in market supply and demand, and policy adjustments all serve as reminders to approach the real estate market with caution. 20 million unfinished homes drive tens of millions in China to tears. A report recently released by Nomura Securities points out the staggering scale of unfinished pre-sale housing in China, estimating around around 20 million units of unfinished homes across China, left by Evergrande and other failed developers. This figure is equivalent to approximately 20 times the size of China's largest private real estate developer, Country Garden Holdings. The total funding gap for completing those projects stood at around $446 billion, the report estimated. Experts warn that this situation could have a significant impact on both society and the economy, with some criticizing the Chinese government's response as a slow and ineffective remedy, suggesting that pouring more resources into the issue may yield limited results and fail to prevent a collapse in the real estate market. Taiwanese financial expert Huang Shi Song recently analyzed that the inability to complete these 20 million housing units could have a significant impact on both society and the economy. This is a massive quantity, and previously, Beijing hoped that companies like Country Garden or Evergrande could at least deliver completed housing units on schedule. Recently, some industry insiders in China have reported online that property prices in Shenzhen have experienced a stampede stock collapse. In some areas, such as the central district of Baolin, the price of commercial housing has plummeted from over 4.2 million yuan to 1.85 million yuan, a drop of over 55%, while other areas have experienced declines of around 40%. Previously, Bloomberg reported, citing sources, that the central bank is set to launch the three major projects this month, with specific implementation plans. This initiative aims to inject at least 1 trillion yuan of low-interest funds into policy banks in stages through measures such as mortgage supplementary loans, PSL, and special loans to stabilize the sluggish real estate market. The so-called three major projects include affordable housing, urban village renovation, and dual-use infrastructure in urban areas. American economist Davy J. Wong, authorized by Davy J. Wong, analyzed the current situation differently. Because there is currently an oversupply of real estate, Wong suggests that if this trillion yuan were allocated solely to building affordable housing, urban village renovations, and public facilities, it may not be as effective. Instead, Wong believes that the funds should be used to acquire some developers or assist them in completing unfinished buildings. Alternatively, providing housing subsidies to residents in the form of monetary assistance for purchasing or renting homes might be more effective than constructing new housing units, given the oversupply in the market. First time in 17 years, China no longer the U.S.'s top importer. According to a report by Nikkei Asia on the 10th, China has for the first time in 17 years lost its position as the top importer to the United States. This shift is attributed to a decrease of at least 20% in imports from China to the United States from January to November 2023 compared to the same period two years prior. Mexico is likely to replace China as the primary importer for the United States in 2023, reflecting a trend of increased trade with friendly nations and reduced reliance on China. Last July, after the General Administration of Customs of China released monthly import and export figures, several Chinese financial media outlets pointed out that China was no longer the largest importer for the United States. According to Nikkei Asia, based on trade statistics from the U.S. Department of Commerce, China has fallen below the top spot in annual share for the first time since 2006. From January to November 2023, 
China accounted for only 13.9% of total imports to the United States, the lowest level since 2004. Peak imports from China to the United States occurred around 2017, exceeding 21%, creating a significant gap compared to other countries. Analysts attribute this change to the initiation of the U.S.-China trade war in 2018, leading to a continuous decline in trade volume between the two countries, thus removing China from its position as the largest trading partner of the United States. By 2020, with the outbreak of the global pandemic, China resumed production ahead of other countries, once again becoming the largest trading partner of the United States. However, as the United States strengthened efforts to reduce dependency on China and adjusted global supply chains following the pandemic, imports from China decreased once again. Trends are emerging in categories such as electronics, which previously heavily relied on imports from China, shifting towards other countries. For instance, imports of smartphones from China decreased by 10% year-on-year from January to November, while imports from India increased fivefold. Similarly, imports of laptops from China decreased by 30%, with imports from Vietnam quadrupling. Although still relatively small in scale, procurement from Southeast Asia is rapidly increasing. This shift is partly driven by U.S. government policies. The Biden administration is promoting the establishment of supply chains with friendly shores among allied nations. Additionally, tariffs imposed by the Trump administration on Chinese products worth $370 billion continue to be enforced. Against a backdrop of geopolitical risks, global companies are adopting the China Plus One strategy to avoid excessive reliance on China. Analysts predict that the impact of this trend will persist in the long term, with Neil Graham stating that it may take several years for the China Plus One strategy to significantly affect U.S. import statistics.